the first time that I've, uh, you know, been on this side of the webinar. So please uh, thank you so much to Megan for agreeing to help out um, and uh, help Louise and I facilitate this because uh, honestly, we would have no clue. Um, so before we begin, I do just want to reiterate that the purpose of this webinar is to go over what you as an individual should carry in your personal first aid kit. So even when you're hiking with a group, you're responsible for your own individual well-being. And the role of hike leaders is not to provide you with first aid, nor is it to provide you with first aid supplies. Um, so the most that you can expect from a hike leader in a real emergency is that they call 911 and follow the operator's instructions like any other member of the public. Uh, with that said, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Louise Langlais, who has been leading hikes for more than a decade. She's very experienced um, and among the Iroquois Club's leaders, she's well known for being one of our most knowledgeable on the subject of first aid, uh, not least because of the skills um, that, the skills that are required are adjacent to her training as a veterinarian. So without further ado, over to you, Louise. Thanks, Christine, and uh, welcome everyone to the presentation. Um, I'm hoping that you'll get a lot out of it. So I'm just going to uh, start off by just giving a disclaimer that I am I'm not um, an expert. I'm not a um, a medical doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a paramedic. I'm I'm a veterinarian. I'm retired now. Um, so I, I do have some medical knowledge, but certainly um, I'm not a specialist in human first aid at all. And this is not a replacement for a proper first aid course. But what I wanted to sort of do is kind of a show and tell of what I have in my own first aid kit, and then just go through why I've chosen to have those things in my kit. So I, I am going to open this up to um, the chat function of, of Zoom, and I'm just um, asking someone to sort of say why, why is it important for us as individuals to have our own first aid kit? Um, why are we making such a big deal about that? So if anyone wants to sort of chip in and answer, that would be great. Christine will maybe um, read them out. <laughs> Don't all jump in at once. Really? Is everyone shy? It's a chat. No one can see you. And Megan won't even say your name. So there's no such thing as a dumb answer, right? Okay, so I have uh, an answer here. Leadership. Yeah. Okay. To be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. In some ways, it's individualistic. You need to be prepared. Excellent. Yeah, those are those are great answers. So um, definitely, we need to be self sufficient. And another concern, you know, I have as a hike leader is if I was to provide someone with medication and they were allergic to that and had a reaction, I would feel really terrible. And each of us know our own medical histories. So you know, when we um, build our own first aid kits, we can make sure we have things in there that are important to us. So for example, I I get migraines. So I make sure that I always have migraine medication on me because otherwise it's not going to be a good day. So that's one reason. This is another reason. Um, if your leader is injured um, <laughs> and no one else has a first aid kit, who's going to help the leader? Or let's say, I mean, I hope this never happens, but what if you have two people break an arm on a hike? And so the, the leader has supplied a splint and so on and so forth and has looked after the first person and then the, the, either the leader or someone else trips a minute later and breaks their arm. Now you have two broken arms. Um, that's not a good scenario. So that, that's another reason that it's important that we all have our individual self. So I'm going to, um, again, I'm going to do a little uh, audience participation here. I'm going to present three scenarios. The first one is that um, someone who's allergic to wasps actually gets stung by a wasp on a hike. 
The second scenario is um, someone falls and they cut themselves and they happen to be on blood thinner. So they're bleeding a little bit more than an average person would. And then the third scenario is someone actually breaks an arm. So the question is, we'll just start with scenario one. What should someone who is allergic to wasps have in their first aid kit? Um, so if they get stung, they don't have a problem. So if people want to just sort of chip in. So we're getting a lot of answers about EpiPens and Benadryl. Perfect. Yeah. And then scenario two, what, what would the person need to address their cuts and scrapes? So I'm not talking like a major laceration that needs stitching. I'm just talking, you know, you're badly scraped and you're just bleeding more than average because you're on blood thinners. What, what would you want in your pack or in your kit? So we're getting band-aids, pressure dressing, tourniquet, wrap, gauze and tape, mm -hmm. tourniquet, polysporin, mm -hmm. applying pressure. Excellent. That's cool. And then the third scenario, what, what would you want to have on hand in case someone actually has broken their arm or their leg? And on, in my personal experience, the arms are more common. Here we have a split and a sling, splints, tensor bandage, triangle bandage to make a sling, sling, mm -hmm. find a stick. Cool. Is that to beat the person that tripped the hiker that fell and broke their arm or? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, and then the next question for each of those scenarios is what would happen if you didn't have stuff? So in scenario one, if someone's allergic to wasps and they don't have their EpiPen or any Benadryl, what could happen to that person, if anyone knows? Okay, Kathy says they could die, 911. A lot of, a lot of death and stopping breathing and anaphylaxis. Yeah. Shock. Yeah. It's pretty serious. Yeah, you could either just be, you know, have a really swollen face or you can go in an anaphylactic shock and die. So the second scenario, if you don't have um, supplies for um, cuts and scrapes and you're on blood thinners, then what could happen potentially? Yeah, bleeding a lot, uh, passing out, loss of blood, prolonged bleeding. Fainting from blood loss, excessive bleeding, shock, dizziness. Yeah, could be messy too, right? Get your clothes all dirty. Or you can make your hike leader faint because believe it or not, even though I'm a veterinarian, I can, oh, human blood, ugh, um, makes me woozy sometimes. And then the third scenario, if you break your arm and then you're forced to continue hiking to get to the paramedics or whatever, what could, what could happen if you didn't have a splint and all that material. So additional pain, shock from the pain, passing out from the pain, swelling, tiredness, fracture gets worse. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting some comments that your voice is a little muffled. So to be honest, we did check the um, the audio and potentially it's a device issue, but Louise is gonna get closer to the microphone okay. to help. So is that better if whoever commented, um, is it better now? It's my webcam, it's, I think it's my problem, not theirs. Better? Oh, nobody's saying it's worse, so. Okay, Alrighty. Um, so these are the answers I came up with. Um, so yes, I agree for scenario one, you sh should have Benadryl and an EpiPen on you if you're allergic to wasps. And I know EpiPens are expensive. You can maybe talk to your um, family doctor. There are sometimes less expensive um, things like maybe intranasal epinephrine or something like that. Um, for minor scrapes, whatever, you wanna be able to clean it. So disinfected, you want something clean to cover it with, and then you want something to put pressure on it. And if it's small, a band-aid will do, but sometimes they're a pretty big um, cut and you want something that's gonna cover it a little bit better. 
And then for a broken arm or leg, you're going to want to splint uh, padding, something to wrap around the padding so it doesn't come off. Um, I personally like tensor bandages or a product called Vet Wrap, which is kind of like a stick to itself type of bandaging material. And then um, pain medication would be nice because um, well, apparently that hurts a lot. I've never had a broken arm, thankfully, but I've heard it's pretty painful. And then the things that I worry about if someone in my hiking group was allergic to something and they weren't prepared is that, you know, some people suggested this, it could be anything as minor as just breaking out in hives to anaphylactic shock and death. Um, for, um, you know, just a minor abrasion, but you're, uh, you're prone to bleeding, you know, you're going to be bleeding, it's going to be messy, maybe it's going to get infected because you didn't cover it. Um, I don't think they would bleed out enough to be anemic, but I don't know, right? Like blood thinners really impaired um, clotting. So if, if the bleeding continues for a long time before um, your own body's natural coagulation mechanism kicks in, that's not going to be good. And yeah, you can go into shock if you lose enough blood. And then for um, uh, a broken arm or leg, you can have pain. Um, a compound fracture, that's where the bone sticks out through the skin. That is very bad. Um, and then it's going to get infected. And um, you're not going to heal properly if you do a lot of trauma to the area before your um, doctor can fix that for you, whether it's cast or whether you need orthopedic surgery. I thought this was funny. Uh, a bone coming through the skin is very bad. And I just want to point out, so all these scenarios actually have not happened to me, but have happened when I've been on hikes. Um, the first one I was hiking in um, Scotland on vacation and the girl who was stung had nothing. So lucky for her, I had Benadryl in my kid. I wasn't the hike leader. The hike leader, um, this was uh, HF holidays. They are absolutely not allowed to give anything. Like they are so strict about that. Um, so if I hadn't had Benadryl, um, she would have had a situation. We were in the middle of nowhere too. So it would have taken um, paramedics a long time to get to her. So yeah, it was crazy. Um, the second one happened on a hike I was leading, um, just an older hiker. Um, and again, luckily I had stuff on me and was able to deal with that. And then um, scenario three, I've had um, three incidents of coming across people with broken bones. Um, Two of them were not on my hike. One of them was on my hike. So it, it's pretty common is what I'm trying to say. And I think it's good to be prepared. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to go through what's, again, I'm going to go through what's in my kit. I'm not telling you that that's what necessarily you should have in your own kit. Um, but I just want to sort of inspire you to think about it. And this is not what I suggest we have in our first aid kit. So this is sort of what mine looks like. I've got um, I've got it broken down into two bags. I used to have it all in one bag, um, and then I just found it was a little disorganized, and I I decided to do this. Plus, my bag was a, a dark blue color, and I want that if I'm passed out and someone's poking through my backpack, I want them to be able to find my first aid kit really quickly. Christine and I were talking before um, this lecture started about a SAM splint. So, you know, this is ideal, but it's, it's quite expensive and a little bulky. This is an Amazon um, packing envelope. It has bubble wrap in it. And you know what? You can make a splint with that. You can wrap that around an arm and then you can wrap the tensor bandage around it. And um, that makes a really good splint or uh, a sit pad would work as well. So you don't have to spend any money at all to get a splint. And by the way, this makes a good sit pad too, multi-purpose. Um, and then this is what um, my kit looks like opened up. And I'm going to just go through all the components, but a uh, little quiz time. Does anyone know what this little red funny thing here is? So we're getting rope and paracord? Yeah, it's a paracord bracelet. Um, so you could use that if uh, if someone fell into a hole and you needed a rope to maybe help get them up, or maybe you want to improvise a little 
banister to hang on to and a really slippery section of trail where you tie it to a couple of trees and people can hang on to that or maybe you need to rig up some emergency shelter if you're stuck in the woods in the middle of the night and you want to make a lean-to. Um, it's just something that's good to have. And then can anyone guess why I have a nylon stocking? I will tell you that I use it to fasten those together so they stay together in my pack, but there's another thing I can use my nylon stocking for. Well, it's probably a few things. So this piece is a magic one. So uh, tourniquet? Yes. Anything else? And sling? Yep. You could use it for sling, perfect. And then you could use it to strain water if you had to, I mean, hopefully, uh, and I'll get more into um, emergency water. You could even use it as a carrying bag. You might see you find, I don't know, something cool on the trail and you wanna put it in a little bag. So that's why I have that on there. Okay, so this is my um, kit broken down. Um, so I'm just gonna go through them one by one. This thing is a, um, product called Compede, and it's something for blisters. I got it in the US, and I don't know how readily available in Canada, but it's really cool that if you have um, a hot spot and you rub that on it before it's a blister, it kind of lubricates the area, and then you end up not often getting a blister at all. Um, it's it's amazing. I, I did a coast-to-coast -coast hike of England, and I was starting to get, I, I could have sworn a, a blister, and someone in the group gave me for Compede. And uh, I never did get a blister, so that was super handy. Uh, this is an emergency headlamp. It's a Petzl, and they're really small. They're probably the size of a Toomey. They don't weigh very much. They're only 35 lumens. Um, actually, I think now they come up to 50. But if you're out um, late on a hike and for some reason you're caught after dark, you'll always have it on you. So, you know, ideally, if you know you're hiking at dark, you're going to have something that's 150 to 200 lumens. But in a pinch, it's something that's nice to always have on you. I have a, a lighter and that could be used to disinfect things, but also if you were lost in the woods, you could start a fire and stay warm. So that's why I have that. Um, these are safety pins and then the kinds for babies so that you don't accidentally poke yourself. And that could be used for repairs. It could also be used to, um, I'm just gonna stand up, but if someone has a broken arm, you could pin their sleeve to their coat. And then that could be an improvised sling as well. This is a compass because I think we should always have a compass, uh, duct tape. So even though I had that funny slide, I do love duct tape, it's wonderful. This is parchment paper. The one, the one time I had to look after that chap who had um, the Mr. Blood Thinner guy, I, I didn't have anything to lay out all my bandaging supplies on and I was trying to keep everything clean and it was kind of muddy. So I've just got a clean piece of parchment paper all folded up and now I can open it up. It, it's quite big and I can lay out all my supplies and get everything organized before I start um, attending to people. I have a little bit of sticky tape here. These are stair strips. They're amazing. Like if you've got a laceration, you can fix that in the field very easily. Um, they don't work well if you're actively bleeding, so obviously you have to control the bleeding, but uh, they're great and, and they're not cheap. Um, but I think they're I think they're a must have in your kit. This is a sterile glove. I don't I don't want to go on touch anyone's blood no, no offense people, but we don't know what people have, right? Someone could have hepatitis or HIV or anything. So you should always have gloves. Please don't touch other people's blood. Um, this is Hypofix. This is something that I've recently um, gotten onto and I just have a little tiny piece of it in my kit, but it's kind of like a sticky tape and you can use it on a hot spot before it's a blister as well. And then it just stops things from rubbing. And I'll often put it on preventatively. Like I have some hiking boots that rub on my little toes a bit and they don't generally give me a blister, but it's just a bit uncomfortable. So I can put a bit of Hypofix on and it'll stay on like even in the shower. Um, but you could also use it to tape things. So, you know, when we're talking about splinting things, if you had a lot of it, you could use it to, uh, to put on the outside of a splint in lieu of a tensor bandage. These are little sterile gauze squares. I have mole skin. Obviously I have a variety of band-aids. Uh, band this is um, that wrap, which is some of this bandaging material that that Marin's like, and you can get it at the drugstore as well. It's made by 3M. This is something I do not recommend you have. It's suture material, but 
I had at work, right? So I just threw it in there. And I only have that if I was in the back country and it was a really dire situation where someone was bleeding and I had to stitch them or I had to stitch myself, but um, this doesn't hurt as much. So, um, yeah. So I have a couple of questions, Louise, yeah. before we okay. uh, continue. Yeah, please um, Could you go back to the first slide or the oh, previous okay. slide? Yeah. Um, what is the compete? Is this cream in stick form? Yeah, it's almost like chapstick. Mm -hmm. And, I wonder, and um, I wonder if you could use chapstick. I don't know, right? Like sometimes you buy these, it wasn't cheap. You buy these really expensive things. There's <laughs> that uh, Lanakane um, anti-chafing cream that, um, I, I tried it for blisters, but I have different issues with blisters. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also have a question. Uh, can you provide a list of what you have? Oh, so um, maybe maybe later we'll yeah. type together a list. I mean, I do I do have a YouTube video where I've gone through this, right? So we are we are also recording this, but yes, I think I think maybe if we put together a, a list of everything that you have here and. Uh, mm -hmm what it's used for, that would be perhaps a useful mm -hmm. reference. Yeah. Oh, and this is here because these are really nice blister um, band-aids. They're a lot better than this kind of band-aid if you have a blister. And uh, I think they're better than most skin, but they are crazy expensive. They also come in super huge sizes. Oh. Like, um, like this size. They're called mm -hmm. something like a healing patch or something. I have. I used to have to use them on the backs of my feet. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a, a magnifying glass, uh, so if you had a, a tick and and um, and you needed to see that, I now always make sure I put reading glasses in my backpack because I cannot see things up close anymore. But I was once hiking, and my friend and I missed a turn on the Bruce Trail, and then we've got the Bruce Trail guide out, and we're trying to look at the map, and we're both like, "Oh my God, we can't even read the print." It's so small. It was dark too in the forest. And thank God I had this in my pocket. It's the only reason I'm not still in that in the woods in Beaver Valley. Uh, this is, um, these are uh, water purification tablets. So I've been on heights where um, I've run out of water and it's nice to go to a creek and just get some, but you don't want to drink that. So uh, if you have water purification tablets, you can uh, make extra water. And I've had people who don't bring enough water and run out themselves. So it's kind of nice. I have some emergency money and I always, I have a health card. This is an expired health card. Um, nowadays, you can just put it on your phone too, right? But this preceded a lot of that stuff. So I always had a copy of my health card. Um, and I just want to point out that, the, um, I don't know if Android phones have this, but the iPhones have a health app and you can put your health card number in there and any of your allergies or anything. And the paramedics can access that on your phone, even if you have a screen lock. You have to sort of set it up that you give it permission for them to do that. But that is a really handy way of um, keeping a lot of really important information for paramedics. And then this little bag here contains um, a tick twister as well as forceps. And these are a better way, you know, the CDC official way of removing ticks is using these, but um, I've removed lots and lots of ticks from dogs with tick twisters and never left the head behind. So I personally think a tick twister for me would be easier than tweezers with my eyes and so on. Uh, folding scissors. This is just a memory board, you know, if someone breaks a, a nail or I, I buy a break a nail. And then these are lancets that diabetics use to poke their fingers and they're really good for poking blisters and they're sterile. I've never had to use it, but when I was on the coast to coast, there was someone in our group that had a blister and I gave her one of my Lancets. And she said she didn't even feel like when she poked her blister, it was totally painless. She was so excited. Um, Cause I think this is nasty using a sewing needle. Like that's gotta hurt. Oh my gosh. And it's not clean. I don't care. I guess if you burn it with your lighter, put alcohol on it or whatever, I would much rather use a Lancet than that. And then I just wanted to put this here just to remind people, this is how you're supposed to remove a tick. And um, yeah, as a veterinarian, I saw so many broken ticks where people did it wrong and there was a piece of the head still embedded in the dog, which isn't a good situation. <clears throat> I also wanna mention there's a lot of old wives tales 
if they put Vaseline on it or put this potion or lotion on the tick and it'll just drop off on its own. Well, you know what? They actually regurgitate everything in their stomach into you before they let go. So if they have Lyme in them, you just made them spit it all into you. So don't do that. That's very bad. You want to do it the CBC way. And then I have um, a tensor bandage. This is what, you know, the vet wrap looks like that when you buy it brand new. Um, and then I have some sterile gauze. And by the way, a panty liner is sterile, right? So you can have that in your first aid kit and you can use that as a dressing. And it does, it's not as bulky as all this and um, pretty cheap too. Sanitary pads too are really good for that purpose. Um, and then this is my medication. I'll just sort of break that down. Oh, and I, I just wanted to remind everyone that what's cool about having a really robust first aid kit is when you travel, you, you just transfer it from your backpack to your suitcase and it just goes with you wherever, whether you're cycling or hiking or canoe camping or whatever. Um, just remove all the pointy bits that they're going to confiscate on the airplane. So I, I sort of broken my meds into sort of gut meds and then pain meds. So this is my migraine medication and I put it in a little tin and you'll see that I waterproof everything and they're kind of waterproofed almost in triplicate, right? Where I have a little waterproof bag here and that's in a waterproof bag as well. But anyway, so I have my uh, migraine meds. This is ASA, you can chew that if you're having a heart attack. Um, this is Aleve and this is Tylenol and together they're um, at the appropriate dosing, they're as, as effective as morphine. Um, I was told that by a paramedic and he gave me the dose and I, I wrote it down and I have it on a little piece of paper inside there. And I'm not comfortable sharing that because of liability reasons, but you can ask your family doctor for that dose or you can get a friend who's a paramedic or a nurse. Um, this, and I have Advil and Aleve and uh, that's just a little bit of morphine to be used in a dire emergency just because I camp in the backcountry a lot. So um, I have that. So you can maybe ask your physician for a couple of doses of a very, very strong painkiller. Um, yeah, they may or may not give that to you. Like what, one dose, really, you're not going to be abusing that. These are my gut drugs. So I have Pepto-Bismol, I have Gravol, I have Imodium. Diarrhea when you're on a long hike is just not a good scene. And this is gas -X. I have that more for when I'm cycling because sometimes, you know, if you eat the wrong thing and then you've got a lot of gas in your stomach and you're bent over a bicycle, it's not good. And then I do not have wasp allergies, but I always have Benadryl. You never know if you are going to become allergic to something. Oh, and I've got this link here, by the way, that's the dose of um, these two together from a trustworthy site. Louise, we have a question. Can regular aspirin substitute for low dose children's aspirin? I don't know because I'm not a nurse or medical doctor. Good answer. Yeah, yeah. You're going to want to, if you have heart problems, you want to check with a physician and just find out what the appropriate dose of ASA is when you're having a heart attack. I don't know. I just have it in there. I mean, if I was desperate, I would just shoot one or two and hope for the best. But yeah, I don't know the actual dose. Okay, and this is just, again, showing that I have something for splinting. And just to point out, you could, in a pinch, use a uh, sit pad as a splint or a, a mailing envelope. And then this is just something I was just trying to find a picture on Google showing that someone's got some padding and then they've got it all taped up. Um, and this is from a credible source. So this is a, an organization that offers first aid for, it looks like, ski patrol. Um, but yeah do a lot with that. And then finally, um, as I pointed out, this is not a first aid course. This is just sort of what I personally have. So I do encourage everyone to take a first aid course because knowledge is power. And then these are just some links where they do show on video how to splint a broken arm, which doesn't replace a first aid course, but you know, people are busy and sometimes they want to go on YouTube and um, look things up. And oh, and that's it. Uh, all done. So questions? So um, it's ASA 81 milligrams for suspected heart attack um, and to chew it. So Anne has uh, let us know that. And I, I do happen to know that 81 milligrams number. Okay. Um, but still verify um, using oh. trusted sources. 
not word of mouth. Um, I don't and see any tastes, questions it coming tastes, in. It probably tastes better than regular ASA. Yeah, I have adult ASA, which is really good. I'm pretty sure they're both pretty bitter or acidic or something. Mm. Um, okay, well, if there are no other questions, then I think we can just say thank you very much, Louise, for sharing. And uh, if you are a hike leader joining the meeting after this, the link was sent out earlier um, this afternoon for that. Um, and if you are a member of the public who joined, um, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we hope to see you on the trails uh, with your own first aid kit. Um, tailored to your own individual needs. And uh, we will send out the recording once it's ready. So thanks everybody. Thank you.